So if you if you go to the Great Declaration commentary and you delve into it, it's a little bit confusing. And so I'm going to break it down as best that I can in simple, basic terms. What this source says, and it's a source that seems to quote Simon himself, what this source says is that God is actually a primal and intellectual fire. He is fire, an, mm. un, an unstoppable, immense, uh, conscious fire. And that God gives birth to two powers. The first one is the great power, otherwise known as mind. And the second is thought, okay? And this is, in, in terms of what comes under the name of Gnostic theology, this is the earliest case where we have these characters named, okay? So thought, or other, sometimes known as Enia or Epinia, she is a very important principle in all early second century Gnostic thought but she appears here first. She is also called the seventh power. And she, as it turns out, is the archetype for human beings. They are made in her image. So that's the Simonian understanding of Genesis 126, where if your viewers are familiar, God says to his, whoever he's dealing with, we don't actually know, let us make a human being in our image. The image is thought seventh power it's not god himself directly and that's the basic the basics of simonian theology and simon himself appears as the speaker of this theology but he doesn't appear as anything else so he's he's discoursing on how he thinks the universe came into existence and he does so through his own very unique interpretation of Genesis 1. Um, just delving in a little bit more detail here. So we think that, or I should say, I think, the Great Declaration Commentary is written on the basis of Simon's theology, and it's written sometime prior to 135 CE. Now, there's a lot of reasons why I think this one of the reasons is, is the commentary quotes a, uh, a Serranus of Ephesus, who is a physician whose writings we have. And so that we know when Serranus lived, we know when he wrote. And if the declaration commentary quotes Serranus, we can get a general idea of when the declaration commentary was written. I also think that the book of Acts partly depends on the great declaration commentary and the book of Acts some people put it very early. I put it around 140 or 150. Wow. So it has to be prior to Acts. Justin Martyr encounters Simonians in Rome about 150, and he accuses Simon, the supposed founder, of deifying himself. That's the first time we get this charge. Now, interestingly, Justin tells this really interesting story about Simonians worshiping a statue of Simon in Rome. Justin even claims that the Romans themselves set up this statue of Simon and put it on Tiber Island. And if any of your viewers have been to Rome, you can still go to Tiber Island. It's shaped like a gigantic triangular ship. And at the very point of this island was a statue. And Justin Martyr says that the statue was actually of Simon of Samaria and that Simonians in Rome gathered around the statue and worshiped it. Interesting fact, in the Middle Ages, we found the base of this statue, and it ends up that Justin <laughs> was either confused or something really weird was going on, because Justin says that the statue was for Simon, the god, so Simone Deo, but actually the statue base, which we still have today, is says that it's the god Simo Sancus. And this wow. is a god of lightning and of, of uh, sort of like a Zeus-like figure. It isn't Simon at all. What I think is it's possible 
that, and I go through this in the book, it's possible that Simonians in Rome still identified this statue with their founder, but that wasn't the original meaning of the statue. The Romans would have understood it in a different way. But there are many interpretations of what's going on here. But this is this is real stuff here. The author of Acts, when we get to Acts, he portrays Simon as a baptized Christian. And this is really important because some people, including many scholars, want to say that Simon wasn't a Christian at all. But the question then is, is why would the author of Acts portray him as a baptized Christian? Right. Well, because, I mean, why would he want to do that? That would have been embarrassing to him. But in actuality, that's probably the case, that Simon did self-identify as a Christian, and that this memory of him as a Christian couldn't be erased. Now, what the author of Acts does do is he tries then, he can't deny that Simon was a Christian, but he tries to subordinate him to the apostle Peter, who shows up in Samaria and sort of puts the finishing touches on the mass conversion of the, of the Samarians. Wow. Probably not really a historical portrait, but an attempt for the author of Acts in the second century to show that, yes, Simon was a Christian, but he was less than Peter, and he was oh, also I greedy. <laughs> I and so there's this, there's, there's a whole history of this. Since I'm not really prioritizing the author of Acts, I'm not going to get into that. Um, that's discussed, in my opinion, far too often. The basic thing here is that you can trust some things in the portrait of Acts, but you can't trust everything. And the criteria that we use here is called the criteria of embarrassment. You have to ask yourself, in other yeah. words, what would the author of Acts be embarrassed about, but still tell you anyway? That's what's more likely to be true, okay, in a historical sense. So next point. We get to Irenaeus. Now, Irenaeus, I'm not sure if all your viewers know some of these figures. I, I should do a better job explaining them. But Irenaeus is this church leader in southern France, what modern day Lyon. And he's the one who gives us this archetypal picture of Simon as the first Gnostic. So before Irenaeus, this wasn't the view of, of Simon. But after Irenaeus, Simon becomes the arch gnostic okay he is the the father of all gnostics everywhere everything stems from his thought or the development of the, of his thought and the simonian theology that Irenaeus encountered and he's fairly late in the second century about 180 by his time simonians were actually using a trinitarian concept of god they claimed according to Irenaeus that Simon actually was Jesus in, sort of in disguise. He was the son, in their language, in Judea to the Jews, but he came as the father deity to Samaria, that is to them. And Simon now exists as the spirit among the nations. Now, this is a fascinating development, and, and it seems to be a fairly late development, but here we have Simonians using obviously Christian language, Trinitarian language, but applying it all to Simon and showing that he is the revelation of the triform Godhead, basically. So he's the son of God? So he is Jesus, okay? That's mind-blowing. That's the, that's the, Samari, uh, the Simonian move. And then... Even later in the second century, this is when we start getting novelistic portraits of Simon who sails to Rome and does these magic tricks of raising people from the dead and killing them and making uh, sort of uh, making dogs speak and, and so on and so forth. And stories arise of Simon battling Peter in Rome. And this is where you get that famous story of how Peter actually murders Simon, because Simon, his final miracle is that he's going to ascend to heaven. And as Simon is ascending before this huge crowd, Peter sends up this prayer to God, 
asking God to bring him down and shatter him. And lo and behold, as Simon is literally soaring through the sky, he falls at random and is crushed to death. Some say he dies immediately, being broken into three pieces. Some say that he was uh, needed, you know, he went to get recovery, but he died in the aftermath of this tremendous fall. Interestingly here, Peter, from our perspective, doesn't end up looking too holy here. He, he basically sends up a, a curse prayer that ends up killing Simon. And that's where the story ends. Wow. The, the final bit of this is, and the very important part, is a woman by the name of Helen, and specifically Helen of Tyre. Now, according to Justin Martyr, who's writing about 150, he claims that Simon was in the city of Tyre, which is modern Lebanon, and he buys this woman out of sex slavery, and he identifies her, he, she becomes his partner in ministry, and he identifies her as the incarnation of the Father's primal thought. That is, she is wisdom incarnate. Sophia. She is Sophia, yep. Okay, wow. And very Gnostic. they travel around and they uh, form their ministry, okay. Now, this is a great conundrum, whether this for, for historians, and it's something that I think mythicists will enjoy as well, because the real question is, did this actually happen, right? Was there actually a woman that he traveled around with, or, did is this a later development of we have an incarnation of Simon or we have an incarnation of God in Simon and therefore we need an incarnation of God's primal thought in the wisdom figure as Helen. Well, my bets are whoever you think Helen was, whether she was historical or whether she's a mythicized figure that was then made historical, Helen was important for, for, for Simonians. Celsus, who's writing about 175, I think probably in Rome, tells us that Helen was a Christian teacher in her own right and that her Simonian followers were even called Hellenians. So I, I think this is important because it shows us that we can't write off Helen. She's extremely important, right? at least to the later Simonians, and she is a divine figure incarnate. She is wisdom incarnate and therefore a teacher.